So welcome to the latest installment of our Torah Botanical Society Spring 2023 Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Jordan Hoffman. I'm a, I'm a professor at Eugene Lang College of the New School, uh, and I'm also the Society Programming Chair. Uh, and so I'm really happy to have everyone here. Uh, and so the Torah Botanical Society is a society that was founded in the, in the 1860s uh, by amateur botanists, as well as students and colleagues of Dr. John Torrey. Uh, who was one of the most influential American botanists of the 19th century. And today, uh, the objectives of the society are to promote an interest in botany and to collect and disseminate information on all phases of plant science. And, you know, we really try to fulfill these objectives through our meetings, our field trips, our publications, uh, and our funding of graduate student research and education, uh, our, um, you know, a sponsorship of symposia and uh, regional conferences, uh, but also especially our public lectures like the one that we're doing today. Um, we've hosted some really nice talks over the last few years, uh, which you can check out on our, uh, our YouTube page. The best way for us to stay updated on, uh, on our future events, field trips, and, and other, you know, lectures like this, other future activities, is to of course become a member of our society uh, in which you'll, you'll receive uh, you know, emails from us regularly. And you can find out more about that on our website uh, that is torybotanical.org. Uh, you can also follow us on social media, uh, especially on Facebook and Twitter at the handle Tory Botanical. Um, and so before we introduce the speaker, uh, we have a quick announcement. So. Uh, we are going to be holding our annual lecture and, uh, and banquet on Thursday, March 14th at, from 5 to 8 p.m. at the New York Botanical Garden Library. This is, this is uh, really exciting because, because you know, we haven't done this. We haven't done one of these in-person events since 2019 before COVID and everything. And, and it's just really exciting to be having uh, you know, another in-person session and this uh, and our annual banquet resuming. <clears throat> so the lecture is going to be entitled uh, "A Century of Change uh, in the Structure and Composition of a Mature Urban Forest," uh, presented by Elliot Nagele. Um, that he is the director of the Thane Family Forest at NYBG. The talk, of course, is free to attend, like all of our talks. Uh, and it will also be streamed on Zoom for those of you who can't attend in person. Uh, and it will be recorded as usual to be, to be put on our YouTube later. Uh, and following this talk, uh, we will have our annual banquet, which will include, include some Greek food and drink that people can participate in for $25 a person. Uh, so of course, we're very excited to, uh, to host this event again. And uh, we have details for this, uh, this event. Uh, that you can sign up for on our Eventbrite page. So uh, today, our talk tonight is going to be presented by Dr. Shauna Rowe, uh, postdoctoral researcher at the University of Cambridge. Uh, so Shauna recently received her PhD from, uh, from in plant biology from Michigan State University, uh, where they explored uh, the biological relationships of varying groups spanning uh, herbivory to mutualism, and using combination of theoretical and lab-based approaches to do that. Uh, today, they work as a postdoctoral research assist, uh, or associate at the University of Cambridge, uh, where they continue this trend by investigating plant regulation of a group of beneficial root-associated fungi that we lovingly know as our muscular mycorrhizae. Uh, and of course, in their spare time, uh, Shauna is one a person of hobbies, loves to hang out with her dog, napping, exploring, and occasionally breaking uh, a DIY home electronics, uh, which is super cool. And so now I would like to hand things over to Shauna. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming and thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, thank you for the introduction. I'm glad that folks are able to come. It's uh, about 10 p.m. here in uh, outside of Cambridge. So you are joining me for my wind down bedtime routine tonight. So that's a new experience for me. And I'm glad that everyone's here. Um, so I encourage folks to um, feel free to ask any variety of questions that 
come to your mind while the presentation is happening. Um, don't feel like you need to stick strictly to the data. If there's anything that I suggest um, or things that I mention in passing about past work or future work or um, how I see my work playing into, you know, broader trends in society, et cetera, um, all of those are fair game and I encourage folks to ask a variety of questions. So um, today I'm gonna be talking to you about what I've been getting started on at um, the University of Cambridge. I work at the Crop Sciences Center, which is a um, new-ish building that has come about as a part of the Department of Plant Sciences at Cambridge. And I began about five months ago. So a lot of stuff is um, getting started and very few things are wrapped up at this point in time. So it's an exciting point in um, this postdoc and I'm excited to share it all with you. So um, with that, I have titled my talk today, Adventures with Arbuscules, and I'm investigating molecular crosstalk and host regulation of arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi under combinatorial nutrient stress. So for my um, broad overview, I'll try to keep us pinpointing throughout. So next slide. Um, thank you. The overview. So I'm gonna get, I'm gonna spend a bunch of time on background to kind of give context about um, the different um, nutrient signaling pathways that I'm talking about, and then we'll move on to my specific research interests. Uh, I'll talk about a couple of current projects, and then the data set that I'm working on building right now, as well as my future plans. So arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. Um, it sounds like a lot of folks here are familiar with a variety of mycorrhizae. Um, so the, the variety that I'm most excited about are arbuscular mycorrhizae. Um, and it's a bit of a mouthful, so we'll break down how these are named. So arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi are a root-associated microbial fungus. So next slide, please. And pictured here, we have um, a rice plant. Now I work at, again in the Crop Science Center. So the model species that I work with is that of rice. And rice are one of the numerous plants that form an association with this fungi. So this fungi is, um, a, it lives in a very uh, intimate environment. It lives literally inside and um, on top and very near the root system, which you can see in the next slide we have pictured here. Uh, so in the soil environment or in the root environment, you see, um, you can, sorry. Um, ah, so we have our root system here. So what we've done here is we've stained these blue. So anytime that you see something stained dark blue, it's important to note that um, AMF or arbuscular mycorrhiza are not actually blue in the environment, but we stain them for visualization purposes. So here in blue, you can see the square plant roots and the vasculature, that coarse stringy bit that's in the middle of a plant root. And inside each of the root cells, these square cells, you can see this highly branched tree-like structure known as an arbuscule. And this structure is the structure that um, our arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi um, get their name from. And in the next slide, you can see a few arrows that I've pointed. So here are three different arbuscules at three different developmental stages. The uh, one closest to the bottom is sort of in its peak time, right? So this is a the site where nutrient exchange is happening, which we'll get into more later. But um, these, just like a plant, have um, life stages, and there's a lot of dynamics that happen in these relationships. So not only is the relationship changing over time, but the site at which that relationship is also changing over time. And all of these things are um, happening um, within the soil environment. So there's generally a lot going on. And if we go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so why do they live here? Well, um, AM are cool, and we'll get into the reasons why they're very cool in the future. Um, so when I say AM, I'm referring to arbuscular mycorrhiza, and AMF is arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. So to avoid having to say those words too many times, I will use these acronyms in the future, um, and occasionally I will say mycorrhiza or arbuscule. So what you're looking at here is an evolutionary trajectory of modern land plants. So plants uh, at the earliest state evolved from a common green alga ancestor, which you can see depicted in this lower corner here. And over time, 
they um, became more complex and more able to sustain their life in increasingly drier environments to where we get things like the um, flowering plants and the seeded plants like we have today. But um, to make this transition from the aquatic environment to the terrestrial environment, plants needed a little bit of help. And where this happens, um, the next slide, please, uh, is in the uh, association with arbuscular mycorrhizae, or AM. So about 450 million years ago, um, it is believed that this symbiotic association or this mutualistic association's relationship evolved. And the evolution of this relationship basically allowed host plants to have improved root system structures. So since earliest root systems were not as far branching and effective as the ones that we often see if we were to go outside and start digging are today, uh, plants needed a bit of help to get things like nutrients and most importantly, water from this drier environment, which is how um, this relationship formed and consequently has persisted um, millions of years later. And AM, uh, consequently, are not only extremely old, but they're also everywhere. So next slide, please. So as you can see here, I've depicted a variety of environments, um, ranging from dry savannas to tropical environments to urban environments. We see them in um, arid environments, so deserts. And we also see them in places where glaciers have somewhat recently receded. So even though we have a lot of variation with these environments, AM, because of their role in um, this evolutionary history of plants, thrive in a wide variety of ecosystems and they thrive with a wide variety of host plants as well. So the next slide we can see here, we have pictured a beautiful rainbow of fruits and vegetables. And this also shows a wide variety of seeded plants and the vast majority of them, notably not the two that I've put X's on here, um, form this intimate relationship with AM. So AM um, associate with nearly 80% of land plants and they do this across the globe. And they've been doing this for literally millions of years. So this relationship is clearly evolutionary important and it's also stuck around or persisted for a wide variety of reasons. Um, and the main one is that of mineral nutrient exchange. So in the next slide, we'll begin looking a little bit more at the relationship. So we're back to looking at an arbuscule and we can see here, again, we have the rice plant. And if you look closely, I've um, added um, more branching structures also in blue. And this is to depict the mycorrhiza, or more specifically, the hyphal structures or the branching bits of the fungi. So the fungi live, again, both inside the root structure, the root itself and these um, within the cells, but they also are continuous with these hyphal structures that branch outwards. And what this does is it vastly improves the reach and the surface area of plant roots that help it increase its access to things like water, um, mineral nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus, which we'll be talking about a lot today, um, as well as other nutrients and environmental signals. Um, by doing this, this improves host plant resilience to drought conditions, um, potentially flooding conditions, as well as um, pests. And it is even believed to improve communication between plants that are um, more spatially separated. So the relationship is pretty cool and I could talk, many people could talk all day or for their entire lives really about the ins and outs of these relationships. But today what we're gonna focus on um, is mineral nutrients. And mineral nutrients are going to be things that are inorganic. So when I say mineral nutrients, I'm talking about um, different uh, nutrients that you would see in fertilizers. So if you're familiar with NPK fertilizer, that is um, referencing the element sim symbols for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, which are all extremely limited, oftentimes in agricultural systems, and are mineral nutrients that are then supplemented back onto soils to improve plant yield, um, basically around the globe. So the way that this relationship is formed and the way that this um, exchange happens at the site of this arbuscule um, at the next slide is we'll start off with the plant. So the plant again is the house. So when we think about plants being the host, we think about them um, in a physical sense, maintaining a lot of control 
over this relationship because they are, again, housing it. They are um, able to grow independent of the mycorrhizae. And they are also providing um, a resource that the mycorrhiza are, or the AM are not able to get on their own. So here we have, again, rice. And what I'm depicting here is photosynthesis. So using um, energy from the sun, light energy, plants are able to fix or extract carbon from the air, um, specifically carbon dioxide from the air, and then they turn this into sugar. So these sugars are the sugars that we eat every single day. So if you eat broccoli, um, if you eat a tablespoons of sugars, all of this is ultimately derived from photosynthetic processes. Um, and these are also able to be broken down further into things like um, fats, um, more advanced carbohydrates, et cetera. So this carbon source is ultimately what our mycorrhizae are after. So if we go to the next two slides. So sugar being our carbon source, this is um, hexose sugars generally is what I'm referencing. So this would be things like um, glucose. And our mycorrhiza are obligate mutualists. So what this means is that they actually can't live out in the environment without a host plant. So even though rice can be, you know, put up in a sterile environment and maybe, you know, do better or worse, depending on the other conditions, it's able to grow absent of our AM friends here. However, this is not true for our muscular mycorrhiza. Um, AM are not able to sustain their life cycle independent of a host plant, and therefore they're very interested in being able to receive this um, carbon in exchange for the plant. However, a plant, um, in our next slide, doesn't necessarily have to do this. And it, it takes energy, it takes a lot of effort to use the sun to create sugar from the air. Um, they expend massive amounts of resources on this every day. So plants aren't generally, um, and I'm anthropomorphizing a lot here, but plants aren't generally just passing along um, nutrients, um, given that that's not a terribly sustainable lifestyle. So. In exchange, they need something from our mycorrhizal partners. And in our next slide, we so phosphorus is the most commonly discussed uh, currency that is used as an exchange from a host plant. So here I've depicted phosphorus again. Um, it's a mineral nutrient, which means there's no carbon present here. And phosphorus is really important for living organisms because it forms the backbone of all of our DNA molecules. It is a key element in our cell membranes for all cells of living organisms. And it's also a key component for all forms of cellular signaling. So any sort of um, damage responses to things like herbivores or pathogens, and also in humans when we are having our immune systems activated, phosphorus is an element that is present in these signaling processes. And when we're deficient in phosphorus, it massively inhibits our ability to grow. And this is also true for plants. Um, another on our next slide element that is extremely important that AMF are able to assist with is that of nitrogen. So nitrogen comes in a extra forms. So we've got two different forms of inorganic nitrogen or mineral nitrogen, and these are ammonia and nitrate. So ammonia and nitrate are um, both generally available in different quantities and under different conditions in our soil environments. But um, ultimately, this nitrogen ends up again being in DNA, um, as well as um, proteins. It's a key component of protein backbones. It's also notable for plants, um, extremely important for the reaction center in chlorophyll, be chlorophyll being the pigment or the molecule in host plants that's involved um, or responsible for photosynthesis. So without nitrogen, photosynthesis is halted and a plant's ability to continue growing and getting more sugar is extremely limited. Um, nitrogen is also important for um, energy storage molecules like ATP. So with these, the plant and the um, fungal partner are now on a more even ground. So even though Phosphorus and nitrogen can be acquired directly from the soil environment by plants. Oftentimes, as I mentioned earlier, they're in limited quantities. And because the um, AM are able to expand their reach uh, into the soil environment, it increases the plant's ability to receive these 
um, nutrients from the soil when it's been colonized. So on the next slide, we can see that if we look at relative concentrations, or specifically if we have low phosphorus and low nitrogen, sorry, next slide. Here we go. So these downward arrows indicate that the concentrations in the soil are low. So basically the plant is in subpar soil. It needs more nutrients than it's able to get. And what it's being limited by are phosphorus and nitrogen, right? Because even though it's doing photosynthesis, you can only make so much DNA if you don't have phosphorus to build these backbones. So given that, the AM have the upper hand here. And in our next slide, we can see that under these limited conditions of nitrogen and phosphorus, we are going to see an exchange, a mutual exchange between these two partners. Our host plant has decided that, hey, okay, well, it's worthwhile to give all of this carbon that I've been working hard for to this fungus because I'm going to be able to get something back from them. And this relationship is generally stable and we see um, pretty large amounts of colonization. And in the next slide, we can also see how this is benefiting host plants. So these are pictures of rice plants that are currently growing in Cambridge at the Crop Science Center. And on the left-hand side, um, these are uh, rice plants growing in sand and they've received a standard nutrient condition uh, solution that's very slightly limited in phosphorus and less limited in nitrogen. And they've also been inoculated with AMF. And you can see that they're significantly bigger than identical plants in the same tray, same nutrient conditions that have not been inoculated with AMF. Um, it's a little hard to see because it's, it's pretty reflective and pretty bright in there. Um, trying to grow rice at 30C in England uh, takes a lot of light and energy as it happens. So I've put this light or this line up at the top to um, kind of give you an idea of the relative height. So there's a massive growth benefit that ultimately ends up helping a host plant under these limited conditions. And because of this, we see this um, relationship persisting over evolutionary time and over geographic ranges and across um, the entire plant clade, which is really interesting and hopefully something that we can harness for a lot of um, applications in the future. Um, however, if we go to our next slide, a notable thing is that when phosphorus and nitrogen conditions aren't dicey, right, when there's plenty of phosphorus and nitrogen around, as in when one is in a field that has received a lot of chemical fertilizers, um, in our next slide, we can see this relationship mostly isn't going to happen. So as a conceptual model while we're moving forward, you can kind of keep in the back of your mind that Whenever there's a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus, and especially when there's a lot of phosphorus around, plants don't need AM to do the things that they need to do, right? And because of that, they are not going to be giving up as much carbon. They're not going to be facilitating this relationship, and we're going to see significantly lower colonization rates under these um, nutrient conditions. And this is interesting for a wide variety of reasons. The main one is we live in a changing world, and one of the big changes of this world has been the advent of chemical fertilizer application. So if you go to the next slide, this is my times are changing Bob Dylan reference for y'all, and you can see this is my attempt at not having as much of a, you know, the world is on fire and everything is collapsing climate change. Not that there's not a lot of climate change happening and not that there aren't going to be a lot of challenges, but really what I'm trying to depict here is that the key thing that's going to happen is a lot of change that we're likely unprepared for. And these changes can be seen both in the weather, as I'm sure many of y'all in North America are experiencing right now, but in our next slide, we can also see it just looking at our soil quality. So. A lot of agricultural practices, this is from 1990, but the figure basically looks the same in 2005, and it's a little bit worse, of course, by 2015, but our soil quality has changed dramatically over the last 100, 150 years, and a lot of this is related to um, advances and changes in the way that modern agricultural practices are taking place. Um, in particular, the production of um, chemical fertilizers and um, the Haber-Bosch process, which allows us to produce massive amounts of um, nitrogen synthetically that we can then put on our fields to increase crop yields. 
Unfortunately, this has thrown a lot of ecosystems out of whack. What ends up happening is we are depleting um, our finite resource of phosphorus through lots of mining. We are also taking in and uh, we're also producing a lot of greenhouse gases by synthetically producing nitrogen. And we're then dumping all of these onto soils and feeding them to plants. When it rains, it runs off, and we're not doing any of the things that have historically happened to improve soil quality. So for reference, you can see here in North America, there's a big, dark bit of very degraded soil that you may notice hits things like Iowa and Oklahoma and probably Alberta and a little bit of Michigan and Illinois and Kansas, all of these massive places that are historically known for agricultural production and notably have had things like their topsoil blow away during the Dust Bowl. And in that next figure that popped up here, um, we can see that a lot of the soil degradation predominantly has happened as a consequence of agricultural practices. And these agricultural practices are no longer going to be sustainable. So our next slide, um, inspired by graffiti artists from around the world, if you resist change, you will be here forever. I added this because I think that this is a, a, good, a good thing to keep in mind when we think about what we're going to eat and climate change. We're at a point where things are just changing. And because things are just changing, we need to think about and understand how those changes are going to affect things like our food systems, how these changes are going to affect the relationships that drive production of food, that have driven and contributed to soil quality and soil health. And the relationship that's near and dear to my heart is that of our muscular mycorrhizal fungi. It is, again, um, spanning the world. And although, of course, this is not going to fix all of the problems in the world, it's um, something nonetheless that is related to these changes and the changes in soil degradation. So moving on, we're going to, um, through the talk, uh, start looking at my specific research interests, which on the next slide is improving agricultural sustainability. And the way that I think about this is through fertilizer use or hopefully reduction of use as well as land management. And again, there this is not um, something to be thought about in isolation. And I hope that everyone has their own thing that is near and dear to their heart in addressing this. But um, when thinking about fertilizer use and improving agricultural sustainability, on the next slide, the main question that I'm looking at in my postdoctoral work is understanding how host plants respond to our muscular mycorrhizal fungi under combinatorial nutrient stresses. So what I mean by that is thinking about how plants are regulating control and controlling um, AM colonization when faced with multiple different nutrient stresses and different combinations of those stresses. So in particular, I'm looking at what role um, that nitrate starvation plays in host responses to AM. So if you recall, I talked both about nitrate and ammonia. Um, and in my work currently, I'm focusing on um, nitrate because of a rice specific um, historical accident, more or less. And also the main question is how do phosphorus and nitrogen signaling pathways interact with one another? And more importantly, how do those interactions and um, the combinatorial signaling and stressors affect how AMF is being regulated by the host? And then finally, um, expanding back out after nitrate, how do ammonia and nitrate response pathways differ um, with regards to the previous? So thinking about these combinatorial stresses first with nitrate and then moving forward and thinking about them with ammonia to kind of broaden uh, our understanding. So on the next slide, I won't spend too much time here, but you can see the purpose of this is to um, sort of illustrate the difference in what genetic regulation looks like um, on a plant's end in response to different nutrient conditions. So in our first panel here, we see how a plant would be responding to high nitrate conditions. Um, so there's a lot of nitrogen around, you know, there's less of a need maybe to um, uh, promote colonization in your root systems. And in panel B, we are in a phosphorus deficient condition. So there's more of a need to promote colonization. And um, notably, these panels are separate and distinct. And there is not a panel here that shows 
what's happening when both of these things are true. And the reason for that is because it's not really understood. So in our next panel, we can sort of think about this in a higher up level on our next slide of understanding how these two different types of responses are interacting with each other. So when a plant is faced with changing nitrogen conditions and a plant is faced with changing phosphorus conditions, but it's the same plant, how is this regulation happening? What is affecting what? Are in different plant species is something more important? Does it take priority? Does this change over developmental time? All of these things are things that um, I'm hopefully going to be exploring. So on our next slide, we can look at what is already known about co-limitation in nitrogen and phosphorus. So it's known that there exists an optimal nitrogen and phosphorus ratio for plants and that this varies by species and environmental context. Generally, it's seen that nitrogen is um, more important than phosphorus for the plant. Um, and it's not fully understood why. One of the issues with asking these questions is a lot of times we are considering the um, we're considering the question sort of in this attempting to catch everything all at once when sometimes, um, your plant's just not growing, right? So if your plant's not reproducing because it's not, or if it's not uh, replicating its genetic material and it's not replicating its cells, it might not be doing that because it's not photosynthesizing. So it's not necessarily that phosphorus is quote unquote less important. It's that the thing that it needs first to grow is to eat. It's never gonna grow if it doesn't eat, if it doesn't have the energy, if it doesn't have the capacity to do so. And because of that, under extreme nitrogen limitation, you see more um, issues and more um, growth limitation, as you can see in this picture here. So you're going to see for the rest of this talk, you're going to see LNLP, and then same thing with like HNHP. And what this means is low nitrogen, low phosphorus, or low nitrogen, high phosphorus, high nitrogen, low phosphorus, and high nitrogen, high phosphorus. So this is a combinatorial um, or a factorial set to where we're looking at basically changing all of these things and seeing how all of the pairs work. And as you can see here, even if you increase phosphorus, if you have low nitrogen, the plant's not getting that big. Um, however, your plant can do quite a bit of growing uh, under high nitrogen conditions, um, even if there's low phosphorus. It might not max out, but it's, it's still doing all right. And in fact, I replicated this response in lab with my rice, which you can see on the next slide. So these are plants that I grew last fall, um, actually my first plants that I grew in Cambridge. Uh, so we, we spent a lot of time together learning about the growth chamber together. And you can see in the exact same order, I have low nitrogen, low phosphorus and my low nitrogen, high phosphorus, both, both pretty small. You don't actually really see a growth jump until you get to the high nitrogen, low phosphorus. And then of course, very happy looking plants with robust root systems, very green and um, lots of shoot growth under high nitrogen and high phosphorus conditions. And uh, in the next slide, we'll start breaking down a little bit more what this looks like. So there are um, a variety of proposed mechanisms and very few known um, specific crosstalks, but generally the relationship kind of um, ends up looking like this with relation to uh, colonization by AM. So under a low nitrogen and low phosphorus, you can see here again, another blue picture. So this is a root system, again, of rice um, colonized by AM. And under low N and low P, we have a bit of a P starvation response, um, but our nitrogen um, or a nitrate response, which is basically a response to high nitrate. So what this plant is experiencing is in starvation and pea starvation, and it's responding as such. So we see a small amount of colonization, but still the plant just doesn't have that much of a resource to part with. Um, however, in the next slide, we can still see a, a starved plant, but here the fungal structures that we're seeing are not, um, not that a key structure that are buscule, that point of nutrient exchange. We see other fungal structures, we see some colonization, but the plant's really not engaging still. It's really not um, ready to um, pass things along. And the plant also seems to still have a phosphorus starvation response activation, at least at the genetic level, even though it has plenty of phosphorus around. Um, this seems to be a consequence of uh, the effect of nitrogen, but again, this is still not understood. 
Um, and then the, the classical condition that we tend to look at, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, the classical condition we tend to look at when we're talking about colonization by AM is this high nitrogen, low phosphorus. Um, this is where our plant's able to grow, but it's only the phosphorus starvation response that is being triggered. This is the classic condition set that is looked at and investigated, and a lot of research on AM colonization is done under these conditions. So you can see this picture is basically just blue. We've got a big old spore. There's our busculas all over the place. This plant is just covered in um, fungi and lots of nutrient exchanges happening. And now when we get to our final picture for our high N and high P, we can see that despite the plant being really big, not colonized consistently in studies, when you have plants that are exposed to a lot of nutrients, you'll see that they're more or less cured of AM. So this is that this is that phenomenon that I was discussing earlier. And these changes, um, in particular, the first two panels compared with that third panel is something that is extremely interesting to me. Um, why is it even under these low conditions? Is it that the plant is um, not engaging? What are the genetic mechanisms that underpin this? Um, is phosphorus exchange happening at our buscules in these um, lower nutrient conditions, or is it um, more or less unfunctional? So, or non-functional. So, this is this is what I'm aiming at exploring. And in the next slide. I, again, yeah, so my goal here is looking at how NMP cone limitations change over time, and uh, I have, will then walk you all through uh, experiment, a couple of experiments that I did that I'm still processing, where I've been working on developing a data set to query transcriptomic and physiological changes over time and under dynamic nutrient conditions. So this will take me to my most recent projects. So this is um, a lot to process, but we'll walk through it. Uh, but it's it's this is my experimental design. So on this bottom, we have a timeline where it says WPI means post inoculation. So that's just the number of weeks that have passed since the plant and the fungi have been formally introduced. And I've tried to keep things color coded for low in um, low P, low in um, high phosphorus, uh, high nitrogen, low phosphorus, and then high nitrogen, high phosphorus. So I'll consistently use these colors and green is our standard condition. Um, orange is our luxury condition. This is when there's just lots of nitrogen and phosphorus around. And then the blue and the pink are two different um, low conditions where we kind of see some of these abnormal things happening. So if we go to the next slide, we can see what we would expect, what the standard situation is, and that is that colonization is going to increase over time. So here we have different developmental stages of rice. We've introduced the rice and the fungi at a young age, and as the weeks pass, we see an increasing amount of our root systems are colonized. So under our standard conditions, you know, we go from about 25, 30% colonization to nearly 100% colonization at the end of the experiment. Great. The experiment is working as planned. This is more or less the process that is understood and assumed. Um, so next, um, again, we have this over time. And then on our next slide, we can see what this looks like in comparison to our high nitrogen, high phosphorus controls, our low nitrogen, high phosphorus controls, and our um, low nitrogen, low phosphorus controls. Where I've already mixed up the colors here for you all, but only on the last two. So they're, they're low and low. Um, but as you can see, over time, we don't get that same dynamic. So our high nitrogen, high phosphorus, it's a little messy, but especially by the end of it, we're very poorly colonized. And then low nitrogen and high phosphorus and low nitrogen, low phosphorus really seem to max out in how colonized they get for reasons that, again, aren't fully understood. And what I wanted to do was um, not only compare this over time. So part of this data set, the baseline is, being able to look at the different changes over time just in these different conditions. But I wanted to also test how these different conditions either um, primed or prevented plants from responding um, in terms of their colonization regulation to um, dynamic changes. So either injections of nutrients or withdrawals of nutrients. So the second part of this experiment on the next slide was thinking about suppression. So what I mean by suppression is we have 
a nutrient condition. And then say we just dump a bunch of nutrient or fertilizer on our field, or we have a bunch of runoff from a highly fertilized field. So three, four weeks into our planting season, we just throw a bunch of phosphorus and a bunch of nitrogen in our field. And what does that do to our colonization levels? And how long does it take it to affect those colonization levels? And does the initial nutrient conditions affect what that ends up looking like? So again, here we have our controls and now we can see what happens uh, a suppression from our different nutrient conditions. So under our standard conditions, um, we have a predicted suppression. So when you add a bunch of phosphorus and a bunch of nitrogen, it starts reducing colonization. So the, the term that we use is aborting the arbuscules. And this is a process that's pretty commonly observed, but you'll notice in both the low nitrogen, high phosphorus and low nitrogen, low phosphorus conditions, we don't seem to see an aggressive suppression. Um, interestingly, in the low nit nitrogen, high phosphorus conditions, it seems to maybe suppress a bit, but it's not, it's not that dramatic. However, in the low nitrogen, low phosphorus, it may be improved colonization, which was a particularly interesting result. And I'll talk about that a little bit more, um, but let's look at the second or the third experiment before we get to discussing this. So the third experiment was looking at recovery. So if we start our planting season with a luxury conditions, um, we put our plants in the ground, and now we put a bunch of nitrogen, a bunch of phosphorus. What does that mean for the future of colonization? Well, what we see here is whenever we go back to our standard conditions for high nitrogen, high phosphorus, and then go to standard, even after this ended up being five weeks after recovery, which is pretty close to when rice start seeding or flowering in the growth chamber in our system, um, we don't see that the plants are able to recover their colonization levels, which is um, interesting and concerning if I were a rice farmer hoping to have good colonization by AM. Um, and we see a similar uh, we see a similar thing at here as we did in the suppression experiment, where we don't really see anything dynamic happening in our low nitrogen, high phosphorus treatment, but in our low nitrogen, low phosphorus treatment, again, we see something that um, is much more dramatic, right? We see that colonization is able to pick up significantly faster than either our standard condition or our other um, high phosphorus condition, which again was not something that I was expecting. Um, and if you look at these plants, um, so if you move ahead two slides, yes. So here we have as a reminder for you what these plants actually look like. So in the recovery period, these are the controls you've pictured here. You can see how significantly different in size the low um, nitrogen, low phosphorus versus the high nitrogen, high phosphorus are at the end of the experiment. So this kind of I'm is setting up context for the idea that um, a lot of this regulation might be happening at a stoichiometry level. So the ratio of nitrogen and phosphorus that's available to the plant and the importance of this over the um, life cycle of the plant. So in the, in the next slide, um, we're, we're going to start discussing this a bit. And this seems to be an indication of an optimal nutrition balance. So there's significantly greater recovery of colonization levels under um, low and low P conditions than there were in other conditions. And this might be for a lot of reasons. I'm very excited to see what the um, molecular data and the transcriptomic data shows whenever it comes back. Um, but what I can't help but think is it might very well be that the plant was so stressed that it's not actually responding to the fact that these are luxury conditions. The levels of, nu of nutrients in the plant system are not signaling internally in the same way that they are in the high nitrogen, high phosphorus condition, um, especially given that there seems to be an inability to suppress colonization levels when the plants are initially too stressed. So when they are so stressed and then we add them back that fertilizer that they need, the plant isn't seems to not be triggering the genetic mechanisms to abort the colonization like we see when the plants are relatively happy, which is again, very interesting to me. And I'm looking forward to seeing what that ends up looking like. So moving forward with uh, future plans, I'm working on developing a data set, as I said. So the data that I showed you here is the first round of data. So this is literally colonization counting. 
That's unfortunately a little slow to get out. So it's not a complete data set, which is why um, you didn't see statistics that you might like uh, in normally see here, but it's in progress and the data does generally look like this and follow these trends. And what I am um, doing also with these samples is two additional things. So we have the colonization information, and I've also taken RNA samples from both the roots and the shoots. And these RNA samples will allow us to um, look at, so the, yeah, the next slide, um, look at uh, transcriptomic changes. So expression changes over time and develop a profile basically um, across developmental stages, um, across these different nutrient conditions over time, as well as looking at these dynamic changes in these nutrient conditions and get an idea of either individual genes or suites of genes that are enriched or um, not active, possibly involved in signaling, et cetera. And this, this will be, I think, a really powerful data set, especially paired with these colonization levels. And um, further, I've set aside additional root samples that have been preserved um, for more advanced microscopy to look at um, higher definition structures to get a better look at those arbuscules, because there's a lot of um, morphological differences that you can observe in the root systems as well. And it can give you an idea and an indicator, at least, of how stressed the plant is, or if you're able to see um, common developmental trends in the arbuscular cycle as well. And um, all of this is, again, is a, a goal for developing a conceptual model of plant regulation of AMF under dynamic nutrient conditions across growth and developmental stages. So I'm really excited about that. And um, that is going to get paired with um, something that I'm continuing from my PhD work, actually, which is a 3D printing project, um, which I'm really excited about. And it should be one of my last few slides here, I think. There'll be a picture. Good. Ah, here we go. So I've been creating a pot system for now almost three years, which sounds like a long time to be making a plant pot. And I think it probably is, but the first version wasn't 3D printed and the second version will be. So I've been working on developing um, a, basically this pot, which I've, I've created one um, from pre-printed materials, from a variety of non-printed materials, more or less, that I'm able to use to grow plants and that are colonized by AMF in such a way where I can very um, tightly track and quantify how much of different nutrients are being transferred specifically from the AMF, rel from the AM relative to um, what's being transferred from the roots. Um, and I use, I do this by looking, by using isotopic la labeling, specifically using radioactive phosphorus allows me to um, literally trace nutrients through a plant system and um, identify where they came from. So I'm really excited to um, continue using this and um, contributing this information to, again to this data set that I'm building. So basically looking at how much phosphorus is actually being transferred and correlating this with colonization levels that we're seeing, as well as looking at how that differs in those, um, in particular, those two lower nutrient conditions. Um, this is, all, is also something that I'm able to use with mutant lines that we're developing and will hopefully continue developing by finding um, candidate genes of interest that are involved in this process. Um, through this data set. So this, this data set is something I'm really excited about um, in building. Um, maybe I will be able to talk to some of you in the future, probably a year or two uh, as this stuff comes through. Um, and I, yeah, I'm excited to see where it goes. So that's more or less where that is. I think I maybe have a couple of more slides. Ah, yeah, there's my wonderful lab at a pub, very British of us called The Punt, which is also apparently very Cambridge, I learned very recently. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge um, the folks at the Crop Science Center at Cambridge. It's been a, a wonderful opportunity, specifically Jongmin Choi, who's pictured here on the um, left. Um, she's my uh, PI at the university and also a, a Royal Society fellow. And it's been a, a good opportunity to be able to continue working on the stuff for my dissertation and um, develop more um, tools. Um, also, uh, Saskia Birch is pictured, Alia, um, myself, and then um, this person on the far right is another PhD student. It's uh, We've all been pretty new at the center together, and it's it's been extremely helpful. Um, I harvested 
a lot of plants. I harvested 340 plants in the process of getting that data set over four different weeks. And it ended up being about a thousand samples and a thousand different Eppendorf tubes and a lot of small little metal ball bearings. And all of these folks were extremely helpful in developing that and everyone else who's been um, contributing. And then of course, um, to y'all for joining me on this talk your afternoon and my evening into the Tory Botanical Society for inviting me today. Um, I appreciate your um, time and your consideration and I am have been very thankful to learn about the society and that there is another Tory society outside of the UK, the one that I've become more familiar with lately. So this has been um, great. Um, thank you. And if you have any questions, I'm available to answer those. Thank you so much, Shauna. That, that was great. Uh, and of course, we're happy to have you too. So thank you so much for, for coming and, and speaking to us. I think this was, this was really fun, really interesting. Uh, we don't often get a lot of opportunities to learn a lot about, about AMFs here. Most of our attention is very focused on, on the plans themselves. Um, although we have definitely been uh, doing more exploration into mycology lately and also into like some interesting uh, plant interaction with, with the other organisms. Uh, and so this is an excellent piece of that growing catalog. So thank you. Um, like I said before, everybody, uh, please, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to write them in the chat. Or if you want to ask your question in person, uh, you can use the raise hand function and we can call on you. Um, to, to ask a question in person. And uh, I'm happy to see that we already have two uh, questions in the chat, which is fantastic. So I'm just gonna start from the top here. Uh, so do the fungi, in addition to consolidating nutrients, process them? Do AM enzymes have a molecular effect on these compounds, making them easier for the plant to process? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, as far as making the plants able to process them uh, for phosphorus, at least, my um, understanding is that the enzymatic effect from AM is potentially in a solubilizing externally. So phosphorus is typically bound up a lot. So you might have heard of rock phosphate. And this phosphorus, because it's difficult to access, um, the plant or the fungi are able to, you know, better explore better access the stuff that is available, but it's also believed that they release phosphatases, an enzyme that breaks down phosphorus that makes it more able to be acquired. But once it's broken down, it's more or less just transferred to the host plant because it's in a pretty um, available, even if not mobile form, once it's broken down into those individual phosphate ions. And nitrogen is also probably um, in a similar state at that point. Um, an interesting thing about nitrogen is that uh, the story around nitrogen is far less understood. So the form of nitrogen that is um, transferred to the host plant has historically been assumed to just be ammonia, but there's increasing evidence that it's also nitrate. So it's unclear if there's different mechanisms within the AM that are responsible for um, you know, nitrification or denitrification or changing things around, or if it's a, just a direct transfer mechanism or assimilation, all of this stuff is pretty opaque. Um, I didn't mention this in my talk, but one of the reasons why AMF is, or uh, arbuscular mycorrhizae are not um, very well understood is because they're actually a pain in the butt to work with. Um, in addition to being an obligate, uh, they've got like genetically distinct nuclei and in individual cells and they like shoot them to their other cells and what makes an individual is not clear and the species aren't well-defined and they are just generally difficult to function with. So those are great questions. Um, this is a long-winded way of saying, we don't really know for sure, probably not with phosphorus, but the, also the mechanisms aren't well understood. That's really fascinating. Um... Thanks for that extra little nugget of information. That definitely makes me more curious about, about AMFs. Um, uh, very interesting. They're wild. Uh, they get weirder too if you keep looking. <laughs> well, that's the case with all fungi. Every fungus <laughs> just true. seems to get stranger and stranger when you look more and more at it. Um, uh, let's see. I'm going to read one more question and then and then we have a um, we have someone raising their hand. Actually, uh, uh, Lydia, why don't you go ahead and ask your question first? 
Okay, actually, it's you. You you start. You mentioned it. I was going to ask about the the taxonomy of the AMF and whether it, it's a generalist or whether these are really specific. Like, is would you you have if you were going to do this experiment on a different like something other than rice? Would the same um, like stock be able to be used or? So this is a great question. And it's also a rabbit hole I've been trying really hard not to fall too deep down in the lab recently. Um, not because I shouldn't, but because, you know, time's a limited resource. So um, I'm going to answer, hopefully, your question. Let me know if I don't answer it. So this particular, so it is a generalist. So this particular variety of um, AMF that we use, we use Rhizophagus irregularis. And then it has an accession number that's like D-O-A-M, and then there's like five numbers after it. And it's basically the same thing everyone who does molecular studies more or less in the entire world uses. And it seems to be a fungus that was isolated from outside of Montreal in the 70s. And people have just been passing it around literally the globe for a long time. Um, but rice doesn't really grow in Montreal. So the rabbit hole that I was avoiding is why do we why do we use this specific variety? Is there another variety? It seems like there's a lot of other... Um, varieties of both the same species, but also other um, mycorrhiza. And there is also a little bit of variation in the ways that the structures form. Um, I Something that I'm interested in doing in the future is looking at how some of these responses change with um, AM that's isolated from a soil environment that's um, wetter. Because something that I'll, else that I didn't comment on here is um, our rice are growing in sand and a lot of rice are paddy cultivated, which is a semi-aquatic environment, which is way different than growing in well-drained sand. So there's a lot of these things that are variables that are a little difficult to um, replicate in a lab environment. And I think are definitely worth exploring. And I think that there's a lot of probably, my guess is there's a lot of variation in how the fungus is directly responding. Um, I'm not a, uh, so, I'm a biochemist by training, and I'm also a plant biologist by the rest of my training, so I'm um, not super good at taxonomy. I'll start there. Um, the clade, it's a its a monophyletic clade, so everything is pretty closely related. It's pretty um, evolutionarily distinct from other fungal clades, um, the mycorrhiza here, and but they do have a lot of variation. So if you look at their geographic distribution, you see things all the way up in Alaska, down to the tip of India, you see stuff in Indonesia, and they've been co-evolving with in different environments with different plants, and there is definitely some variation. And I think it's something that the field has not really been doing is looking at how these things vary and not really considering how host systems are possibly interacting with the um, fungi from the Canadian fungi, basically, which is a very, very specific, very northern environment to just be using casually. Um, this is, yeah, I lost a couple of days a few weeks ago thinking about this. I think this is a great question. Um, I don't have a good answer. It also doesn't seem to necessarily be in the literature, to my knowledge. If anybody here knows otherwise, let me know. I would love to know. This, this is super cool. It's love, interesting sometimes, sorry. <clears throat> oh, I was just gonna say I love how these questions kind of connect to one another because I had a, I like that was sort of one of my questions was going to be about like the the sort of uh, distribution of the different uh, like like taxonomic groups because I know that these all belong to the same phylum Glomera mycota, uh, but there's obviously quite a lot of variation within this group, uh, but also at the same time that is a totally incredibly widespread um, global phylum and I just find that the whole thing to be quite interesting. I'm sorry, Leah, I cut you off. Oh, I was just going to comment quickly. It's, it's interesting sometimes when you, there's something that's done a certain way for a long time and you're like, is this for a reason or is this just because everyone else was doing it and so it continues on and like what, what kind of like implications that might have? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I do find that very interesting. We have more questions in the chat here. Um, so annuals often seem unable to respond uh, once their season progresses. Would you expect a different pattern using perennial species? That's a really good question. Sorry, I'm thinking about this. Um, 
speaking of things that have just become things that we do, uh, a lot of scientists who do the type of work that I do, so plant biologists who do molecular studies, exclusively use annuals, in particular annuals with short lifestyles or life cycles on purpose. And I think that this is a really good point. I think I would probably expect it to be different with perennials, especially given that print a lot of perennials you can literally like literally uproot and put someplace else or chop down and they grow back um i am not well versed on the literature uh, admittedly on how host responses in perennials um function i do know that with it being this broad you do get amf in um lots of perennial plants of course and that the you do since you have these dynamics within a life cycle so you get arbuscules last for about 10 days on average they're first really small they branch and then they have a full collapse period and it's pretty well documented and it also varies between species so my expectation is that you're going to still see you know the arbuscule stages but i expect that you'll see different colonization patterns maybe based on tissue growth um in new growth versus old growth you tend to see um, more colonization at like branching points and roots or cracks in roots where they're able to actually get in easier. So you'll probably see more colonization whenever the soil is warming up and the plants are growing more. So I know that there are some plants that do a lot, of, like in Michigan, for instance, you can see it on the trees. There's just like a spurt of growth in the evergreens. And I would expect that you would see colonization patterns that probably match with that. Um, I've seen people who forgot to fertilize their plants for like three weeks or four weeks and their plants were looking rough and they eventually colonized, but they had to grow a lot first. So I think the plant is probably prioritizing growth. Um, there's also some weird dynamics that aren't well understood about AMF or AM that can become kind of parasitic or have a negative effect on the plant. So I, I think there's probably a lot going on there and I, that's, yeah, these are great questions. I found what you said there to be quite interesting about the the sort of 10 day lifespan of the actual arbuscule structure, um, which was very interesting. And like, this is obviously kind of an intrusive structure that sort of squeezes in between like beneath the uh, the cell wall of the of the root and like kind of worms its way around the cell membrane inside the, the cell. Uh, and, and this is very coincidental because I'm teaching my students right now about, about AMFs in, in our class, our mycology class. And um, it's just very fascinating to me that this, this uh, mutualistic relationship in many ways closely resembles a, uh, a parasitism, um, such as the case for many different kinds of symbioses, very much like how lichens and corals have a similar situation. Um, Maybe furthered even more by this whole fact that they can just abort these uh, these arbuscular mycorrhizae under different conditions. Um, I was wondering if you had any any thoughts on on that that whole angle. Yeah, I so my trajectory to AMF when I discovered plants were interesting was when I was a biochem undergrad and I discovered the concept of a plant immune system and my mind was just my eighteen year old mind was just blown. Right, I was like, what plants have immune systems? So I spent four years in a plant pathology lab, and then um, I went to rhizobia, and then I landed in AMF, and it took until I was writing my dissertation to discover that it's believed that the symbiotic, the mutualistic pathway, so the plants accommodating um, AM, uh, likely evolved before the pathogenic pathway, which was also just like, a, you know, 10 years later, my mind's blowing again. And I think that um, it's... It's definitely something that people talk about a lot, but don't necessarily have a lot of, there's a lot of questions left about the overlap between the symbiosis pathway and the, or the um, mutualism pathway and the pathogenesis pathway and um, how things can sort of shift back and forth. So something I'm really interested in is that, that point in which things shift. So in this data set, for instance, that I'm looking at, when you see these arbuscules collapse, is this related to um, mechanisms that are also used 
uh, when plants are defending against pathogens? Is this related to totally novel mechanisms? Are there defense mechanisms that are unable to be reactivated after they've already been suppressed? All of these things are things that I'm um, really curious about that I'm hoping that this data set's going to be able to help me unearth and looking at these dynamics. And it's something that I've been thinking about a lot. And I think it's it's one of the things that I found most interesting consistently about um, mutualisms, how this cooperative relationship is also so close to being something that's antagonistic and how this antagonistic relationship is possibly so close to being something that's cooperative. And, and what is the balance there and which factors are affecting that? And, and can they shift in evolutionary time and context dependent sort of ways and what's controlling that? Yeah, I yeah it's something i'm very question. interested in it's a good question yeah uh, likewise um so we got some more very nice questions in the chat here um what is the relationship between arbuscular mycorrhizae and ectomycorrhizae uh, i study rice plants uh did they have ectomycorrhizal partners um i actually get the feeling in a evolutionary sense, Jordan might have a better answer here than me on the um, literal biological relationships between ectos and um, arbuscular mycorrhiza. Uh, they are, um, ectomycorrhiza are able to colonize plants that arbuscular mycorrhiza are able to colonize. I don't know too much about ectos. I would, um, I can answer the second question that's on here, but I encourage you to investigate that a bit more on your own. I'm a little I'm a little unfamiliar with the ecto li literature at this point, but ectos are, um, they're more well studied than arbuscular mycorrhizae because they are on a more of an external um, feature and they're generally better characterized, but I don't, I don't have a great answer there for you on that first one. I'm sorry. I'm actually wondering part. about specifically in the rice fields, if you're studying rice patties, right? Um, with things in ectomycorrhizals you're seeing. Um, and if that plays a difference in the way nitrogen and phosphorus are actually processed by the plant. So I would expect that would be different. Um, one of the things that, so the, that pot system that I brought up at the very end, one of the things that I've been interested in is trying to study, hopefully this is clear, trying to study the dynamics of the AMF relationship in isolation while also accounting for more things in the environment. So this first came up for me in looking at legumes that also associate with the nitrogen fixing bacteria, but also other fungi as well. So if there's if there's AMF around, and there's also you know ectos around or ericoid um, mycorrhizae around or rhizobia around, what proportion of its nutrients or its resources are coming from AMF relative to these other partners? Does the plant or do different plants prioritize this? And this is um, this is uh, within the sort of realm of questions, though I admittedly have not thought specifically about ectos. I was thinking more about bacterial, but this this idea of partitioning when you have these like multi-partite interactions and how these things, I think that these things aren't well understood because I think, well, one, they're really difficult to study. And two, we've got this whole like academic division of labor thing where people are either molecular or they look at communities and there's not a lot of interaction between those two groups. But I, I think that I think that this is a really hard thing to know. I think it's difficult to um, spatially separate ectos and arbuscular mycorrhizae and ericoid mycorrhizae and all the other types of um, symbionts that are around. But I, I hope that more tools are being developed so people can start looking at these things and that we have more higher throughput. And these are questions that I'm also really interested in. But I, yeah, does that kind of speak to your question? Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I actually know John Lynn, so yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Sure. Elaine, you also asked a second question. If you'd like to read it out loud, you're welcome to. Yeah, I, it seems that Shauna actually has read it, yeah? Um, yes. Um, the unit of analysis, does the unit of analysis make sense? Right. So the um, for everyone else, the question is, because AM are so hard to define as individuals, is genome sequencing the best way to study their processes? Um, do you mean the genome sequencing of the AM or of the plant? Of the AM. Ah, so I, um, so the RNA-seq, um, thank you for this, the RNA-seq, uh, the transcriptomic work that I'm hoping to do is actually going to be on the host plant. Um, one of the issues for context on uh, with AM is that this uh, weird 
multi-nuclei, diverse nuclei and in individual cells thing actually makes it really difficult to sequence. So the um, first sequence, the first draft of the genome sequence was in 2014. And it was previously believed that the genome would be really small for rhizophagus irregularis. And it turned out to be massive, like one of the largest fungal genomes out there. So I personally don't really plan on doing any work directly with the um, fungal genome because of this. I find it very, um, I don't even know what that would look like. I probably need another PhD or like an extra master's degree or something. Um, I, my fungal, you know, fungal genomics and fungal genetics is something that's a bit beyond my reach. Um, one of the things that we've talked about is possibly um, in the future, the second version of this will hopefully involve single cell um, RNA-seq. So we'll be able to pull out individual nuclei from the plants. That way we can um, get higher resolution of um, transcriptomic networks and whatnot. And whenever we do that, because we will have these tagged plant nuclei, we're going to have remaining nuclei and we'll be able to identify um, fungal nuclei as like the leftover bin. And we've talked about potentially finding a collaborator who knows more about um, fungal genetics and transcriptomics and whatnot, who might be able to help with that. Um, as it stands right now, I don't personally know anybody with that expertise. If anyone here does, I think it'd be interesting. I don't know if it's the best way to study the processes. I would say no. Actually, I think no is what I would say. It's not even, I don't, I think that there's a lot of promises that you can make with, um, you know, genomics and transcriptomics. And I think that AMF have pretty consistently defied expectations and they've a lot of people stopped working with them because at the end of the day, the best way I could find to answer some of these questions was pulling out the radiation, which is a thing that a lot of people just stopped doing in like the eighties and the nineties, because it's, you know, not fun to work with radiation. It's a little scary, but it actually seems to consistently be one of the better ways to work with AM. It, these older sort of reliable system agnostic methods seem to be much more effective. And then um, employing some of the sort of um, more modern genomic genetics methods on the host plant. And then my hope is marrying the results from those things and getting sort of a broader, more holistic picture. Um, that's, yeah, that's my goal. Thank you. I do think it's a really interesting question. That will be very, uh, I'll be very curious to, to see how this sort of plays out with, uh, you know, applying some genomics aspects, transcriptomics aspects to, to this group, um, you know, with a lot of fungi, identifying individuals can be really challenging. <laughs> so okay. it's it's certainly not something that is is um, exclusive to the group, but certainly more complicated, perhaps, by uh, um, by by these glomerulomycetes' unique lifestyles, I suppose. Um, uh, one final question, and then I think in your head. That I feel <laughs> I should I should pick. <laughs> this is good. I, I'd, Thank I'd you. Be, I'd be happy to chat at any time. I okay. love talking about this stuff. Um, I I work with uh with lichens, so it was my my uh, research of, of uh, uh my area of expertise. But uh, but I did do genetics work, so we can totally talk if you'd like. Your gateway, um, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, okay. One last question, and I think that we can let our speaker. Uh, uh, retire for the night uh, since it's so late over there. Uh, thank you again for sticking it out with us. Yeah, um, been, it doesn't even feel late. This is great. These are great questions. Thank you. <laughs> so last question, were these plants grown from seed? And if so, uh, were they sterilized prior to inoculation? Asking because of the potential for rhizophagy uh, influencing AM inoculation. Yeah. Um, so I'd be interested to know more about um, sort of the, the context that you, you have in your mind um, when asking this question, but we did, these were grown from seed. Um, they were grown in a sterile, they were um, germinated in a sterile media, and they were done after a, a bleach surface sterilization. Um, I know that there can be some bacteria that survive on the inside of seed coats, but the typically what we'll do is we'll just let them grow or germinate in a sterile environment for five-ish days. And then if they have any contamination, we toss those plates out and then we plant them um, from the sterile plates. Um, they're not sterile immediately after that. So we sterilize everything in advance. It's a clean inoculum. It's not usually a sterile inoculum. So it's it's isolated spores and it came from a sterile environment, but it's like 
clean water, clean glassware, et cetera. And then it goes into the soil environment. Um, and then it's sterilized, you know, pots, sterilized soil, but all of that goes into a chamber afterwards. So there's definitely other stuff in there. I've seen contamination. Sometimes in the slides, you can see stuff that's not necessarily um, AMF. Um, some folks do grow plants sterilely. It's something that I've resisted. I think plants typically don't like being sterile, kind of like if we sterilized our skin, it doesn't perform as well because we kind of need our microbiome, right? So plants have, there's like a wide set of things that we absolutely don't understand nor can we control for that are just sort of constantly present with plants forever that involve the outside world. So they, they tend to be a bit more stressed out when they're sterile. They also tend to be like a really high humidity and a lot of other weird stuff happen when they're sterile. Um, so I can tell you that everything was either sterilized or exposed the exact same way. So everything receives the same degree of sterilization and then everything receives the exact same inoculum and everything has the exact degree of um, either sterile or less sterile or semi-sterile growth media. So there are almost certainly things that are um, affecting the colonization that are not necessarily directly being tested. Uh, this is sort of a constant problem in my mind when we think about these or many other people's too about what's affecting what else could be affecting um colonization um but it, it's pretty it's pretty predictable colonization usually so the controls are what we use to verify that so when i kept showing that you know nice early colonization increases under our standard conditions the reason i do that um is partly i mean of course so I, we have something to compare with the data to but um, I also, it's the first thing I count if I'm counting slides, because I might be counting 170 slides and it could take me months to get through. And I'm seeing blue arbuscules in my eyes, right, every night for weeks. And if I find out that my controls don't work like I thought they did because of something like this. So I always start there. Um, but yeah, is there is there something in particular you were interested in or you're thinking about with this question? No, you actually, uh, uh, thanks for the answer. And um, uh, and you somewhat alluded to it earlier when you were talking about the uh, uh, rhizobium in particular, uh, you know, because that's that that that's where uh, the concern comes in. You know, are there other microbes that are actually producing or functioning as providing nutrients to the plant, um, and that are spe bacteria specific? You know, not necessarily rhizobium, but you know, other uh, bacteria that have been. Uh, uh, investigated like Pseudomonas and other bacteria that can mine for bacteria or for mine for these uh, resources, uh, bring it to the plant and uh, and and cycle those nutrients through the plant. Um, but you alluded to it earlier, where you said you know like there's bacteria and other things that could be uh, and you know and other fungi. So appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's a great thing to be thinking about. It's a thing that I think about constantly. Another fun fact that's weird about AMF is they seem to have a unculturable endobacteria. So there's a little bacterial species that lives on the inside of our muscular mycorrhizal fungi that people just discovered once and people don't know what it does. Somebody managed to cure some fungi of it and some people ask questions, but for the most part, we ignore it. So I would say there's definitely a lot of stuff going on. Um, there's also like, I think, uh, specific microbes on the outside that associate with the um, arbuscular mycorrhiza as well that are very recently thought about that I have not read too much about, but I think there's also not a lot written about. So yeah, a good question, a holistic question too. Question I think about, keeps me up at night. <laughs> well, that's pretty wild. That's a wild revelation to drop on us right at the end there. It's like, yeah, oh, I, look at all this other stuff. I, I that... felt like I had to tell him. He he asked, and it was it was a good question. I was like, you you must know about this mysterious little bacteria that lives inside these fungi. Uh, it's this fascinating stuff. Uh, I feel like I feel like every time that we take a an organism we're familiar with and we examine it on a finer and finer scale, we find some new wild thing like that. Um, yeah. like re like recently, there's you know there's been this whole thing about about uh, like Basidiomyces yeasts inside of inside of lichens that you know people wonder or exploring how how ubiquitous they are that, that maybe it's some third symbiont it's you know it's more complicated than that but seeing similar 
uh, you know, revelations kind of kind of across these different groups is very exciting. It's very interesting to hear about stuff like this. That is very interesting. And that's a very interesting rabbit hole you've just provided me with in the future. Thank you for that. <laughs> it's wonderful. Well, well, now we've exchanged rabbit holes. So <laughs> yes, perfect. you can go down yours and I can go down mine. <laughs> wonderful. Uh, well, again, Shauna, thank you so much for, uh, for speaking to us today. This was wonderful. It was really great to have you. Um, and, uh, and thank you for coming to, to, to join us in our society for this.